Bem-vindo a todas, todos e todos ao ciclo de diálogos transnacionais de 2022. Good morning and welcome everyone to our seminar. This session will have simultaneous translation for English and Spanish translation. Click on the little globe below on the bottom part of your screen and choose the language you will listen to. Transnational dialogues are a series of roundtable sessions and they have been organized since November 2020 as part of the Our World Heritage Movement. The objective is to promote mutual listening and talk and listening to talk about cultural and cultural heritage. We are here to celebrate the 50 year anniversary of our organization and focus on Article 5, which exhorts the need for the natural and cultural heritage have a function on the life of communities. The roundtables throughout 2022 will focus on three aspects of daily lives, art, food and housing, as strong proposals to turn heritage into the day-to-day -day lives of communities and vice versa, questioning colonial practices and ideals. To decolonize is to multiply multiple perspectives and narratives in order to try to develop together a less segregated world and a less hegemonic world of what is considered heritage. This first roundtable, which opens up the cycle and the, the first EBA international, EBA will be international seminar, will talk about decoloniality. The objective is to reflect on the place, the standing of cultural and artistry in the urban landscape, and also to consider in under these issues, what happens in the lives of communities with their different social layers and ethnical groups. Today's debate inserts, as I say, opens the first EBA -UB, a session organized by Media Lab and Hybrid Passages organization from the Fine Arts School of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and is supported by many institutions and organizations such as the postgraduate program for projects and and heritage from the ufrj also the institute of culture and urbanism from rio de janeiro university the council of the portuguese language architects also politics and territory group um from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, the Cultural Heritage Center from the University of Chile, Catholic University of Chile. We thank them all for all their support and their partnership. I now give the floor to our host, our main host of the EBA Ubi seminar, Rubens de Andrade and Michele Pais from the Fine Arts School of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and we will then invite some of the representatives of our partner institutes here present to greet you. Rubens, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Monica. And we'd like to thank you all for being here, those of you interested in talking about decoloniality, arts, and cities. It's a pleasure for us from the Fine Arts School to be here sharing with you and forming this partnership with the Our World Heritage Initiative where Professor Monica has connected many connections for us to move forward and extend this network. I now give the floor to Professor Michele, who actually Michele is, is the first person to initiate the EBA Ubi project. And I'm very pleased that, that I'm here to share this project with her. Professor Michel, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Rubens. Thank you, Monica. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to everyone. This is the third edition of EBA Ubi, the arts festival for this audience. Here, we're going to talk about refugees, reinvention of cities, habitable spaces and our interest and scope here is to deepen the think of decoloniality in many roundtables on behalf of the organizing committee i'd like to thank you all for your presence we're very help 
we're very happy to have all these partnerships with the development of this uh, organization. I'd like to thank the scientific committee members who selected the works for this third edition to the researchers who sent their papers for this edition, the artists who will also be taking part. And above all, I'd like to thank the partner institutions of this third edition. I, I wish you all a fantastic event and long life to our to ourselves and to our event. Thanks very much. We now give the floor to some of the institutional representatives who are here with us. Frances Francesco Bandarin, one of the Our World Heritage founders, Margaret Shokyu, coordinator of PGPP, Noemia Bahadas, representing CAO, Maria Elisa Batista, president of the IAB, and Hui Leon, president of CIALP. Good morning, Francesco. Hello, greetings from Italy. Dear Monica, all my colleagues, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you all, all the organizers and participants in this seminar on this discussion on the colonialization. Our world heritage, as Monica explained, is, an org is a civil society organization which promotes a change in the way heritage, especially the world heritage, is managed and used. As my Monica explained, last year we had many debates, a series of debates about the most important heritage issues, and today is the continuation of this great work. We have 134 events. We had 134 events last year. What you are proposing to talk about today, I think, is strategic. I think. Uh, national realms have not re yet really latched on to colonialism, what it means. This way here, we can anticipate what we want to build. We are also very interested in the system of innovation within heritage. This is also at the center of the debate today, because arts and we metropolitan populations, that is also the theme of a talk. It will be presented as an event at the CULT World Conference in Mexico in September. Elitopolis studies the metropolis as heritage. This study also will help us to work together on this. Thank you all very much. Monica, dear colleagues, it's good to see that heritage brings up so much interest around the world in order to renovate its meaning. Thanks very much. Thank you, Francesco. Now giving the floor to Margaret Shokyu, PGPP coordinator. Thank you very much, everyone. Good morning. The World Heritage, our World Heritage team, all those here. I'll be speaking quite quickly. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge this great initiative by the group on my behalf and the Rio de Janeiro Federal University program, I'd like to say that it's very timely to have these debates on cultural heritage in peripheral countries. This, of course, has always been a very important issue. And I think currently, this is, it's especially important to talk about this. Social uh, media has an, a loose, uh, a, an incredible power to join people Sometimes um, overexposure of central countries can be a bit of a problem, but social media also provides us with the opportunity to to talk, to be here and talk about and debate culture. I think the recognition of the elements that built, have built and build our I cultural identity are the acknowledgement that each one of us as citizen and as peoples from different countries in this world. I said I was going to be very quick. I hope I wish us all a great session today and for the future sessions. Good morning to you all. Thank you, Margaret. Giving the word, the word now to Noemia Barradas from the Center for 
architecture and landscaping, GAO. Good morning, everyone. I'm representing the Architecture Council Vice Presidency. I'm very happy to be here participating in this session, this initial, this beginning, this dis important discussion in 2022. We are in the middle of Brazilian heritage. Um, at the end of the last um, seminar, we're talking about such an important subject to us that work with architecture, cities, art. This is essential. And I'd like to congratulate, especially Rubens Andrade and Michele Salis and Monica Bahia, who have structured this week, which starts today, because it's not just about the event of our world heritage. We also have the Federal University event, ever event. This is important, always talking to the issue of housing and heritage. So I'd like to congratulate you all. And I know the Architecture Council um, is available here to talk to you about cities, democracy, and all relevant subjects, which we'll be talking about. Thank you, Noemia. Giving the floor now to Ia Baines, Brazilian Architectural Institute president. Good morning. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of all those who built these translation, transnational dialogues, who organized the event for today. I'd like to especially thank Monica, who joined us here together. I'd like to say that the IAB is very happy to be here with you. We are a, a people of crossing. We are in problematic times, and we are seeking reasons, roots, and dreams for fairer, happier, better lives. We have a tough history, and it wears us out. Fernando Ilari summarizes well. He says, all modernity, modern projects are rooted in coloniality, deforestation, Amerindian Holocaust, slave labor, monoculture, landowner monoculture, export of primary goods, informal settlements, and police repression. Giselle Sousa Martins summarizes, the slaves brought coloniality to Brazil. It came through them. The sweat and blood of those who were left behind is what was used to build this country. We as architects and urban planners ask, what will we do with this history, with our future, and what will we do today? The answers, if there are any, demand a multiple look, which involves dimensions from the scale of the body, the body which is not necessary, the man, all the way to social dimensions, politics, and ecology. Amongst ourselves, our action in the present, memory intertwines itself. We want to build a world where we can all live in on this small planet. We need to continue this necessary dialogue, this multiple and multiplying conversation to look delicately at places and people and times we still have left. Third, collective hope and design our future with courage, happiness, creativity, so we can jump into this endless sea. I wish you all a wonderful event and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Maria Elisa. Finally, I can give the floor to Rui Leon, president of the International Council of Portuguese Speaking Architects. Good evening, good morning to you all in Brazil. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee of this event, which seems to me, which is very relevant for the architectural community and the community of people who are around and within architecture. I think he's broken up. This debate, it is possible to exercise the broadening action you have had on that you organizers have ha had been able to assemble in the form of this event. Thank you very much, Monica Bahia, Rubens, IAB, Rio de Janeiro, Architectural Institution of Brazil, all other 
institutes and universities who helped originate this event. It's very, it's an honor for us to be involved in these conversations because it's a, this is a conversation that must enter our practices. They must, it must permeate our con collective consciousness and we have to carry out this exercise, which is collective exercise that stems from all of us. The post-colonial discourse must be collectively chewed and digested in order to allow history and culture and identity be reconstituted. This exercise is something we, this is not just one more Congress, one more symposium, one more set of talks. No, no way. To me, this discussion and this platform that you have built and made grow is much deeper and it has a much wider meaning that, that we are capable of re reforming the future, rewriting the past. So I wish everyone all the success in the world for this table. Thank you, Hui. We will now start with an introduction on decoloniality with Shahi Varga, who, who occupies Arti Mapeji in critical communities and on anthropology, indigenous peoples at Cape Town University. He has been the head of the anthropology departments at Durban Restville University and Wit Watersand, and he was the head of the social science school of the Wit Watersand School. He has been active in the History and Archaeology Council in the international ICMH and also in ICON in South Africa. He's the research director for public um, subjects. He's been in this head uh, in in all those institutes that uh, Paula mentioned. Shahi Varga, please, you have the floor. Yeah, your sound is off. I don't know if you... My, my, my apologies, my, my apologies. <clears throat> I want to thank everybody that has been part of this process of organizing our World Heritage, uh, these debates, these sessions, these conferences, webinars, globinars uh, that have reached all across the world. I think this has been a, an extremely important uh, initiative. Uh, and um, as one of the speakers has already mentioned, uh, we hope that many of these discussions begin to be translated into practice. Uh, without too much uh, uh, to, to say uh, on the introductions, let me get straight into this. Um, decolonizing art, in, especially as this is part of the discussion uh, that we are beginning with, but art, architecture, design, and so on, is not um, a new call. Uh, it has been around for a long time, at least since uh, the early liberation movement started uh, in the late 18th century, uh, maybe even before that. But it is a new and it is urgent now that we address not only those debates of the past that were raised since the early anti-colonial movements, uh, the various national liberation struggles, the feminist movements that have existed for the last two, one and a half, centuries, more recently the LBGT uh, movements, but increasingly now also to address um, our universal environment and, and climatic issues. What is new is that how do all these various uh, movements and struggles intersect uh, with our struggle to have a more just and fair uh, set of societies all over the world. It is not 
that art or architecture or design uh, is, uh, has, has, has been rather not part of the majority. There are those in the global south that have been underrepresented, sometimes misrepresented, and sometimes just ignored, and should be now fairly and adequately given recognition, the space to thrive. But it is also a question of what is it of these new narratives, of these narratives that have long been ignored? How do we make them universal? How do we make them enduring? And how do they become representative of humankind? It should be able to move all of us emotionally and intellectually. It should reside in our souls as it is publicly represented in our public spaces, in our art galleries, in our museums, in our parliaments, and in our homes. Perhaps if there are any kind of universals for the global majority that have so far been ignored or underrepresented, it should be how does this art intersect and advance humankind's emancipatory potential? One aspect that is becoming increasingly important is the so-called indigenous or vernacular art, design, architecture, literature. But we have to begin to understand that much of this art of indigeneity depends on the standpoint that comes from Europe, from Europe and from colonialism, from Eurocentrism. The view is that one is only indigenous or exercising one's vernacular aesthetic as seen in relation to a colonial or a Eurocentric position or engagement. That before indigeneity, there was only oneself and those one engaged in, in a more or less equal uh, form of representation. To decolonize art, it seems to me, it has to depart from the idea that Western art, supported by a Western or a Eurocentric system of aesthetics, of design, of patterns, and so on, that has come to dominate the world, is lessened, to some extent eliminated. To do this, one has to depart from ideas of beauty being considered as appropriate in various kinds of portraits, in statues, in paintings, in pleasant landscapes, in historical buildings, and to ask what is the place of art in a different context with new ways of seeing? We might, might, we might want to ask, can indigenous art exist with the history of colonialism in the present context? In decolonial studies, this might be considered as the question of what is the art of decoloniality? How is such an art practiced? And how can it be recognized? And at the same time, how does it push the boundaries of what it means to be free and treated fairly and justly? This begs the question of whether such an art can be understood only in the vortex of colonialism of post-colonialism as artistic practices? Does it mean that all such art is implicitly a question of what kind of aesthetics do the indigenous or the non-European or what is already the majority of the world? How do they practice their artistic expressions? And can it be commensurate or approximating something that of Western aesthetics? Or is it something completely different? that must be re-evaluated or evaluated with a different lens, with a new and historically different set of eyes. These are questions about values, about aesthetics, about craft and its design, materials that are used and other artifacts that make up the artist's body of work. Is it comparable or completely different to the more common assumptions of Western art? Is there a majority art world that can be evaluated differently from the metrics of Eurocentrism? Or simply, 
Can the smaller world of Europe and North America exist in the other worlds of this globe? What other universals or artistic expressions are there that make for a new, different, but still resounds with our locality, with our own narratives and our world heritage, however erased, misrepresented, or appropriated it might be today. And it was with these words that I want to end today, my little speech before we start with the Prairie's presentation. Thank you very much. Muito obrigada pela sua apresentação. Thank you very much for your presentation, Shahid. We will now give the floor to the panelists who will now move, uh, make their presentations. I'm going to briefly speak about all of them and then they will uh, go on with their presentation. The first presentation will be from Monica Lacarria from Argentina. She will talk about new decentralization crossed, to, crossed amongst themselves within art and contemporary cities colonialism or decoloniality. Monica Locohier, PhD in social anthropology from ben Buenos Aires University. She is the main researcher of CONICET, the National Council for Technological Research, head teacher at the University of Buenos Aires. He is the director of the anthropology program on urban culture and project director at the agents of Uber Science and Technology Center connected to art, decoloniality and heritage. She is also works with or in Uber and is director of cultural management from the Uni, Uni, Federal University of Cordoba. She is a global facilitator on heritage and material. She was the public culture master's degree director between 2017 and 2021. She was a vice chancellor for research and postgrad at the Arts University at Guayaquil, Ecuador, from 2016 to 2018. And she was the academic director for the Public Culture Institute in the National Public Institu Culture Institution. The second presentation will be from Raquel Igongo from Kenya, talking about practicing decoloniality in museum. He works at the National Museums of Kenya and the head of the public program for Fort Jesuit World Center. He is a bachelor from Kampala University and a master in site management for world heritage from the University of Turin, Italy. He worked with the Sultanate of Oman organizing the presentation and interpretation of Fort Jesuit in 2017. He's a researcher and has developed permanent exposures in many museums in Kenya and in other African countries. He supervises students and um, many universities in the country. He trains foreign students in the language, in the Kifali language in the National Mombasa and Kenyan University. The third presentation will be by Marco, Marco Polo Juarez Cruz from Mexico, entitled A New Look on the Past, the Harlem Hospital Mural Project, 1935 to 2012. He is, has a master's degree in art history in the Autonomous University of Mexico. He was the head till 2019 of the exposure department in Mexican popular um, culture museum. He was in the Maryland University of Modern Art where he researched this period 1890, 1970. The fourth presentation will be by Mariana Brito from Brazil talking to us about graffiti, a stain or insurgent manifestation in the landscape. PhD in geography from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, PH, a master's degree in geography from the UFRJ as well, licensed by the university teacher, professor. She works in the inst Institute of, she works at Geopol. At her, her PH, in her PhD, she researched public heritage in the city of Olinda, and in 2015-16, she took part in a doctorate program at the University of Paris-Sorbonne. 
she had a post phd internship at the university of sierra in the cultural geography uh, lab among her research themes she is dedicated to geography heritage urban art territory management and cultural policies close wrapping up the session we will have a presentation by Rui Leon talking to us about decolonialization of knowledge, contesting the colonial project. Rui Leon talks about culture and urbanism, especially in Macau and in China. He teaches architecture and editorial work in the areas of culture and urbanism. He lives in, he worked and lived in Santo Tome, Principe, Lisbon, and now lives in Macau. He, ha he is licensed from the Porto School of Architecture, and he has a PhD in architecture and urban planning from RMIT, Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. He is the founder and partner uh, with Carlotta Bruni, where, with whom he develops projects of major infrastructures, public buildings for the government of Macau since 1989. He also works on private enterprises. He worked on reforming the more um, quarters. He has a gold medal in 2005-06, both in co-authorship with Carlotta Bruni and Manuel Vicente and UNESCO or Asia Pacific. He is the president of CELP, from 2019 to 2022 and the president of Docomomo Macau, visiting professor at the University of Macau at the Design and Innovation University. Each speaker has 15 minutes for the representations and then we will have the debates. If it's not possible to respond to answer all questions, we will be sending those to the speakers and we'll make them available at the event website. So I'd like to pass the floor to Monica Lacarrier from Argentina. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Well, I think you can see my screen. I'd like to uh, introduce myself. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Monica. She was very patient during the two months or so that we um, uh, we exchanged messages, and I'd like to thank all of you, all of the organizers as well. Before anything, I'd like to say that I'll be talking and thinking about practices and representations that are recent in the context of heritage places related to urban public art that are developing in cities, in peripheral, in peripheral side, uh, cities, especially in Latin America, and I'll be using several pieces of example to um, base what I want to comment on. And this has to do with the colonial thought in Latin America. But I haven't considered the urban aspects, but the process, the process of um, indigenous major minorities. First of all, well, I'm going to zoom in my screen. I'd like to think on the new roles, how they are assumed by the artistic practices deployed in relation to the breaks from which other comfortable heritages are produced. To what extent are the new links an eruption? How, how to, to back to the question and forces the rethink. So as well said in this slide, we have to reflect on the new roles that are taken with the new uh, artistic practices and produced by other heritages and comfortable ones that serve to ask us how to think of the decolonization, decolonization processes that legitimize brutal thoughts, recognition and social visibilities, and fundamentally of power questioned by the right to have rights. The intervention made by a group of activists 
on the Isabel de la Católica in La Paz statue. I think it is a, case, a pragmatic case to start how you can see how this represent this heritage representation results in uh, in, a, in a conflict scene and a, and a creative scene, as said by a Bolivian activist. It is it wasn't just a monument, but a representation of the white woman, the ideal woman valued by its beauty and association to the coloniality and power. The Catholic uh, statues are part of a, uh, a static created by the fine arts and incarnated in this hege in the hegemony. And that has been classified by a group, by racists. And it, it seems to be evident that that this seeks to destabilize the um, to the right of the look and contemplate the statute linked to the logic of coloniality. So this performance that implies the the. Uh, politicization of critical thoughts. This is not necessarily implies a an institutional destabilization or in, or radical thoughts and problematization of the thought related to that. So this is still under the inertia and logic of the colonial power. And then we have to ask ourselves up to, up to what point does the does the heritage and new urban art reflect cracks in the continuity and, and of the power? I mean, how does how does art and heritage linked to coloniality? We'll, we'll question that. In other words, to what extent do they reflect this colonial spin, especially in this case in Latin America? Can the urban public art become a dissident, a fundamental component in the questioning of heritage from which our cities reference and break national histories and symbols? So we have two cases here, Guayaquil and Buenos Aires. The first case in general over the last years, we call it creative urbanism, and it was used in historic sites and public, in public spaces just like the city of Guayaquil. Since uh, the decade of 2000 in Guayaquil, Ecuador, to try and find out and find out how the colonial city, how can you, I mean, there's a competition in the, in the city of Quito. So you think of the artifacts that are imposed by the city hall to build senses of, of identity in Guayaquil, Guayaquilena with uh, some painters that associate culture and heritage in the uh, in the contemporary urban art. There's also other projects that strengthen this character of historic neighborhood, as you can see to the left hand side of the screen, but also a place of, of residents, of artists. These are examples of of arts that bring interrelation inter to the art. Uh, the, human, the urban art is seen sometimes as non-art in a city that lacks art. This has taken over streets and the stairs of the, the ladders of the parks through walls, painting and graffiti painting. So the, the city, the, 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 the mayor has brought a, a Plan. They brought international artists and national artists as well to organize arts. As you can see on the leather, that uh, it has colorful layers. As you can see, they want to hygienize, moralize, and reproduce the colonial aesthetics of the city. We could speculate that the aesthetic practices put into practice a traditional meaning of art and also of the heritage. It wants to challenge locals with new with new strategies however this doesn't seem to be reachable 
because it brings, I mean, on, on contrary, And firstly, we have the moralization of public places, and then the, uh, the, the force of regimes that only the smart ones, the, the heritage, can build that. And, and the, the passers the passers by, we consume that on the disability models that are associated to banalization of this public space. Thirdly, we have a creation of more cities and less citizenship. The following one is from the city of Buenos Aires. In the the historic center of the city it has to do with the intervention of uh, of the defense street in San Telmo, part of the idea of urban emptiness, denying uh, colonies the colonization practices that we produce every Sunday. The black people from the neighborhoods they reproduce their uh, drum call. So because of this intervention with neighbors um, of the a government organization and other actors there have been there have been workshops that are connected to this place and they have the, they have a need to, to gain more space to live together and this is also the idea that there would be a crack a wound that would cut this place across so as you can see here particularly in some of those images under this bridge, it, that this was become all what of what the the space shouldn't be, where the creativity takes over this space. As we can see in other streets, where you can see artifacts and objects that are connected to the leveling of the streets or these stones. This brings contradictory discussions. Many people approve this these changes that eliminate the historic heritage but through the idea that you can get to an aesthetics that is according to to colonial heritage uh, imagination what are the groups who disapprove of that and the changes that you can see in other streets as well since the idea that you'll that you'll lose the colonial aesthetics and and colonial uh, objects and so in the first case artistic actions are viewed as Beautiful streets, beautiful, beautiful streets that complement an apparent uh, uh, resume of of the of the colonial heritage. So this is either through the reconstruction of colonial narratives or producing other ones by breaking walls. And let's think: Are these new interventions part of the new? Colonial aesthetics, the artistic, the artistic practices you can see in those cities, do they have their own memories? As in Guayaquil, the search for identity in Guayaquil, so well, this is still attached to fine arts and Eurocentric thoughts. So, we have differences in the arts here. Arts come out of museum galleries, but they are in the public space, recreating a new world of art. That is acknowledged and recognized. This is crossed by the economy of power, of course, and probably because those issues they do not cross the, the field of art because it is critical for those practices. But they can also generate other thoughts from the recovery of the renegated, of the denied memories. The meaning that is part of urban spaces, and they can dispute spaces. But this is not just a nucleus of political insurgents. So little, little, little can this, little can this um, hinder. Um, they, they, they are they're still attached. So. The autos, the self-centered aesthetic is still the, the model to follow, as you can see in the Santelmo comment. Artistic practices don't break the, the imagination in the colonial context to resignify this space, but they, they, are, they are unable to question the 
social learning is that even in a bodied way I received by the colonial matrix. Could we think that certain creative actions such as murals made by young people from the slums of the city of Buenos Aires, they deconstruct the logic of coloniality and become the colonial practices since they argue with power, question from vulnerability and are stressed with the persistent processes of the coloniality of power. The walls on young people's uh, murders made by the made by police. This is important because they raise awareness on subjects and actions and voice the silence re uh, re realized by the colonial matrix. Can they be the colony? The, can that be the colonial art? Because they they seek to change the visual arts and reclassify these social actors. And the artists can be um, protagonists in those points through other artistic practices in which the, the artist builds a wall according to the theme, like in Villa 31 in Buenos Aires, like a priest that was murdered in 1974 and so far is celebrated by the neighborhood. Could we, ex could we speculate that these practices also require others, and especially other accessibility and representation of the memories? These are actions that reveal emerging culture that grew by the time in places where you, th you thought art wouldn't exist, it would be valueless and they coexisted in silence with the colonial power. To conclude, the new digitalization that artistic practice produce, at the same time, political and heritage actions that, that tend and pend to those uh, Western and uh, Euro-centered uh, heritage. And based on other cases, like this urban urban art wall in Guayaquil, and we can see this request here, made by a request and demand by the University of Arts in the University of Guayaquil, and a decision by former President Rafael Correa, and by this idea of converting the city into an artistic city and cultural city, as said before. Uh, this interpolates in a strategy that incorporates diversity crossed by the colonial difference. However, new dialogue, the visual dialogues, usually to be, are usually part of the authority manage, uh, management in the peripheral concept of the cities, where the arts and, is understood in a, in a different way. Young people paint walls on the other partners that were murdered in the city and their behaviors and memories and practices are reproduced that they, they would be questioning the uh, the hierarchy. So there's a sense of social recognition that gives a space to intersections and to the right of having rights. It seems to me this can appear from different cases that you can think and in your crossroads regarding the um, regarding the heritage in Latin American cities. Thank you. Thank you, Monica Lacarrier. Great presentation there. This was great regarding arts and heritage. Now, Rafael Abdumahid Igombo will have the floor. He's from Kenya. Rafael, please, you can start your presentation.
Hello. Hi. Okay. Uh, my name is Raphael. I'm uh, from uh, Kenya in uh, the Fort Jesus World Heritage Site. And uh, I think our time uh, uh, was uh, 15 minutes. And uh, I had some uh, constraints, but uh, at least I managed to come because uh, there were some uh, political activities that are happening in Mombasa. And I was engaged in that, but uh, at least uh, I, I'm happy I managed to get some time to come through. Uh, let me just share some of uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, I want to try and share my screen, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen, but uh, it's, it's like I'm getting some some problems. Landi, parece que o Rafael está tendo problemas em compartilhar a tela dele. Pode verificar se são problemas. Nossa. Uh, uh, Monique, Monique, can you hear me? Monique? Sim, sim, Rafael, sim. Estamos ouvindo. Yeah, I was saying, I'm trying to share my screen, but can you maybe uh, just play the video that I sent? And uh, then I can, okay. uh, I can explain it. Because I'm trying to share my screen, but it's not. Okay. Uh, you, can, you can have uh, when you choose, Rafael. Good morning. Sorry. Lange. When you choose, Lange. Rafael, choose share screen. Then it's easier to open your file. Yeah. Okay. Meanwhile, I wanted uh, Monica share to share screen and uh, also sound, Monica. When you share screen, if you want to yeah. play a video, share screen sound. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Rafael. Uh... Tá certo. É, aguardem, por favor, um minuto, que o Rafael tinha mandado a apresentação dele é, com antecedência. A gente just vai... a moment. Rafael sent his presentation beforehand. We'll be just finding that. One minute, please. Rafael, o Andy vai colocar para você na tela, tá? Oh, we're playing that, so we're going to we're going to play your video, Rafael. Okay. Okay. Good morning. My name is Rafael uh, Igombo. I'm uh, the head of education uh, department in the public programs in Fort Jesus, and right now I'm in the main gallery which is our museum, which has uh, some ethno ethnographic uh, exhibitions, uh, of course, dating back to the seventh century. We have a lot of uh, uh, exhibitions about collections and pottery works and shards that have been collected from different uh, sites and uh, uh, cultural heritage sites that uh, of course, showcases what really was traded during the 15th century, uh, during the maritime trade. Now, uh, my, my, my presentation was about uh, the, how the museums is decolonizing uh, the museums. Right now here, I'm in the, in the middle of the Baluchi uh, exhibition. 
Baluchis are the people who came into for, into for Jesus on the East African coast uh, as mercenaries. They fought on behalf of the Sultan. Uh, behind me, you can see uh, a soldier, a Baluchi soldier, who, of course, the soldiers were fearless and they were brought in by uh, the Sultan to fight the Portuguese on behalf of uh, the Sultan. For instance, here you can see there is a, a map that shows where uh, the Baluchis came from, the Baluchi uh, from the Baluchistan. Uh, just next to it, there is Iran, there is Saudi Arabia, there is Oman, and they came, they sailed down all the way into the East African coast. Now, this is one of the attempts of uh, the museums to be able to uh, decolonize some aspects of the Baluchi people who felt like uh, they were somehow left out in the, uh, in the history of for Jesus. Most of them who fought on behalf of the Sultan were left in Mombasa. Some of them stayed back in Mombasa. And uh, they, 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 they kind of uh, felt like they are out, outcasts of the community. But now we, we did this exhibition uh, specifically to be able to uh, showcase what uh, the importance of the intermarriages between the Baluchi people and of course how their cultures are. For, for instance here you can see there is an exhibition of uh, a, a, a bride who has been uh, displayed here to showcase how their cultures are very similar to the local Swahili people who have intermarried uh, the local people. Uh, the other aspect is that uh, we are really planning to uh, come up with some uh, a museum exhibition, which is going to be all about uh, the artifacts, the objects that uh, have been uh, taken out of our museums into uh, the Western world. For instance, uh, just uh, in front of me here, we have uh, what we call vigangos. You can see these are uh, vigangos. These are sticks that are normally erected on the graves, or on the grave sites, or even on the homesteads of uh, the local Mijikenda people, the Bantus. Now, this uh, normally signifies the, the ancient people or the ancestors. And in this case, you find that uh, the local people would go into the, the gangos and uh, they'll be able to they'll be able to appease their ancestors on these uh, vigangos. Now, at one point, some of these vigangos were sold to uh, some of the American uh, celebrities who had come to visit way back in the uh, 1970s. And they put them into their, their, their of course, their homesteads and houses, but they were haunting them. And so they had to return them back to the museums. So there is this aspect of uh, retribution of objects into back into into our museums, we've had a lot of discussions of uh, the, the 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 objects that are coming back with the communities and trying to tell the communities now what do we do? Where are these particular examples of the objects supposed to be taken back? Because you cannot really tell exactly where did this particular uh, erection of the sticks uh, came, came from, or where where was it taken from? And so you have to take it back exactly to where it had come from. Now, for, the, for instance, uh, for these objects that have come back, we have to work with the communities and ensure that they go back to the communities. They have to have a, cer a ceremony uh, to be able to kind of cleanse the objects that have gone out of uh, the communities, and now they're coming back uh, to them. The space that you can see behind me is a space that we're going to use for an exhibition that will showcase some archaeological artifacts that have been done. And there are some people who are archaeologists who are doing excavation in Fort Jesus, for example, or in, the, in some of, the, of our sites. And uh, some of them are very uh, key. And some of them are very important. For, for instance, uh, when you look at this, uh, uh, the ruins just behind me, we have uh, some uh, ruins of the church that was built by the Portuguese. Uh, it's a uh, Catholic, it's a chapel uh, of the Catholics. And you know Portuguese are Catholics. So there is a lot of uh, colonial, colonial, colonization of the history, or of the aspects of the history 
that we find in, in this particular church here. Uh, Mombasa being dominantly Muslim, you find that uh, the local people would find of uh, find of uh, find this uh, to be out uh, you know, different from whatever they, they they worship, and so they would not really uh, find it important. But we, as a museum personnel, are coming up with a lot of information about this particular church, how it was used, and even how the Omanis used this church uh, to be able to. Uh, do some laundry work, to do some storage in it, and even how they respected the word Jesus. For instance, Jesus is a Christian word, but the Muslims uh, normally uh, would also use, uh, respect the word, the, the prophet uh, Jesus. They not only call him Isa, but uh, he's supposed to be uh, Jesus, and they, they did not change the name for Jesus into any other name, but remained, the name remained Fort Jesus. So these are some of the aspects that you see. Now we are looking at uh, the Africans who worked with the, with the local, with the, with the British or with the, the white uh, people who did a lot of excavations in terms of Fort Jesus and other uh, political, I mean, other, other heritage sites. And uh, they were not mentioned. For instance, in Fort Jesus, you'll find that there is a, a Kakman. Kirkman, James Kirkman was the first curator who did a lot of excavation in terms of uh, discoveries of archaeological artifacts and came up with a lot of uh, written books, but he did not really identify the people who worked behind uh, the excavations. So we, together with the Honeyman Museums, would want to work with the, the local uh, uh, people to identify the archaeologists who really worked well. That was a presentation that I wanted to bring uh, during my when I was away, but uh, it's basically talking about uh, uh, how we are trying to decolonize some of uh, the, the museum activities, some of the museum uh, exhibits and displays. In, uh, for instance, in this case, I talked about the Baluchi community who are in Mombasa and uh, who came in all the way from Baluchistan to Mombasa under the influence of the Sultan during the 15th century when the sultan of oman was controlling the uh, east african coasts and so he brought the the, the, the baluchi people to come and uh, fight the portuguese we have had uh, quite some uh, good uh, influence from the uh, other world that is uh, the east african coast has had a lot of uh, influence from uh, the portuguese who came and built the fort that is for jesus and then you've also had influences of the Indians who came uh, in terms of trade, others who came to build the Kenya-Uganda railway, that is an East African railway line. And then uh, they settled here. Uh, we also have had the British uh, who came to abolish uh, slave trade in, uh, in the East African coast, because uh, at, at some point when the West African slave trade was uh, stopped, the slave traders came towards the East African coast and uh, continued with their business. But now when the British naval ships came into the East African uh, coast, they tried to stop the, uh, the slave trade that was happening. Now, all these aspects, uh, of course, have, uh, uh, have some effects to the local people who have had uh, a lot of uh, uh, emotional uh, uh, feelings about uh, the, the slave trade that was happening, a lot of the architectural uh, design. I wanted to share my screen, but I couldn't. But I had some images of the architectural urban um, landscape of Mombasa, where you'll see some of the architectural designs that are influences from the Omani Arab, influences from the British, influences from, uh, uh, of course, uh, the local people who were using uh, a lot of uh, mud and um, uh, coconut palm for their roofing. And so that a kind of, uh, of, of uh, evolution of architecture into the urban uh, landscape of Mombasa uh, is a way that we, we really work with the Mombasa Old Town Conservation Office to be able to decolonize some feelings that came out of that kind of uh, architecture. Because like uh, during the colonial period in 1895, the British came and colonized uh, Mombasa and Kenya. And so there was some, uh, uh, you know, different feelings about what the British were doing in terms of suppressing the local people. Like they had segregation where Africans could not go to the same school as the British or as the Indians or as the Arabs. So we, we as a museum are trying to come up with exhibitions that will 
decolonize uh, those feelings, decolonize uh, those aspects of uh, exhibitions that would showcase only the white people and forget about uh, uh, the, the black or the African soil. For instance, the people who are working in excavating uh, for Jesus, the, the people who did the, the labor work or people who uh, did the handwork were the Africans. But uh, in, the, in the historical documentation, you'll find that the, the, the person who was, for example, uh, the, the white person who was uh, James Kirkman would be mentioned. But you forget about the other people who physically worked uh, in the fort and uh, did a lot of discoveries uh, towards uh, what is really displayed today. So in our instance, what you're trying to do is you're coming up with an exhibition that will start in November. And that exhibition will be now uh, documenting the African uh, archaeologists who worked with the white, besides the white uh, archaeologists, to be able to come up with some documentation of history, which is really uh, displayed in many of our museums. And so that uh, the, the different eras that uh, came up from the Portuguese to the uh, Arab eras to the British era, and then back to the to the of course the museum, the National Museums of Kenya. This is something we were working on and trying to see how the interaction are uh, really displayed. And one important thing is that uh, as a museum uh, personnel, we engage the community and uh, talk, have discussions, you know, uh, involve them in some of the participation of activities to be able to uh, decolonize uh, some of the feelings uh, that they have towards uh, the heritage sites. Not only for this, but many other uh, different cultural heritage. And this also comes in in terms of uh, the climatic changes that are affecting uh, the local uh, heritage sites. And they also, the community comes in uh, to work with us in terms of uh, owning the cultural heritage site. Like uh, we've had a lot of uh, the sea rights on the seaward side of Fort Jesus. And so there is a, a wall that has been built and the local community have owned uh, that activity and the project in such that they will also participate in some of the climatic change uh, uh, environmental conservation activities to be able to safeguard uh, the, uh, the uh, Fort Jesus because it is part of the two tourism uh, circuit. When the tourists come to Mombasa, they must visit Fort Jesus. And so the environmental aspects of Fort Jesus should be very important and key to them. So this is uh, part of the activities we're doing as uh, Fort Jesus to be able to decolonize uh, some of the exhibitions, the museums that we have and the exhibition that is coming up uh, very soon is called The Ode of Our Ancestors. Uh, we are working with the Honeyman Museums from uh, United Kingdom, and we shall, uh, of course, uh, inform uh, everybody else to be able to see what we are trying to do. The other things we're trying to do is uh, we work with the art exhibitions, the artists, the young artists, and they, they portray their feelings. Whenever they have an exhibition in the fort, they show uh, what their feelings are. For example, Many of the young people would want to show, uh, for example, about the political feelings uh, they have as young people. Some of them feel like they are left out, like uh, the leaders who are coming in are only elderly people, people from uh, about 40 years. But the people who are younger than uh, 25 or even 30 years are not really involved in the participation of uh, the political system in, in Kenya. And so when they come to the museum, they showcase some of the exhibitions that uh, really express their feelings. Some of the young guys would express feelings of uh, the areas that they, li they live in, for example, the landscape of the town. And some would even draw some of the wild animals like the game, the elephants, the lions, uh, the different type of uh, things that they grew a scene in, in their lives. And so there is a lot of activities that are coming up uh, uh, to showcase uh, many of uh, the repatriation, like the objects that have been taken away uh, they were taken before, long time ago, uh, into the Western uh, museums. Like we have uh, objects in Germany, we have objects in, uh, in, in the USA, we have objects in uh, Italy. And these objects have now started coming back, uh, seeing uh, their, their hands coming back into Africa. And so we as a museum have to take charge and uh, find a way of really placing them uh, into our museums or even uh, talking to the communities and seeing how they can get back to the community and uh, be practicing whatever cultural heritage practices and traditional practices that were there. Uh, for instance, the Vigango that I talked about, 
these were some of the, uh, the, uh, the, the objects that were taken away. And now they've come back because they are haunting people wherever they are. And so it is quite important that uh, the local also see this as a way of embracing cultural heritage and seeing how important it is. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I've taken more than 15 minutes. Muito obrigada pela sua apresentação, Rafael, realmente. Thank you very much, Rafael, for your presentation. Very inspiring. And it's very good to be able to walk around the museum with you. That was great. Thank you very much for that tour and uh, the repatriation efforts vis-a-vis -vis the objects. This is very important work that you are developing. Great stuff, great stuff. Marco Polo, Juarez Cruz now will talk about, about a new look on the past of the Harlem Hospital mural project. Thank you very much, Rafael. Welcome, Marco Polo. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation for this fantastically important event. And thank you to all those listening. I'm going to start off now my presentation. This project is part of a, a survey of research I'm carrying out as part of my academic instruments in my PhD, art PhD that I'm undertaking at Maryland University. I'm talking about the communication, the connection between Afro-American art and Mexican art and American art and the contact established in the 1930s and 40s with regard to the projects, but with a social viewpoint. This project was uh, was taken away after the major de Great Depression in the US. I'm dealing with the connection points between the pheno these phenomena. I think it's imp particularly important with regard to the other presentations at this table and I'd like to show these connections between mural art, culture, public art, and heritage, which is a very complex scenario. And talking about the 1930s here, and then the resurgence in 1912 in the crossroads between these two streets in New York City. Passers-by can see this new crystal facade with this representation of the Harlem Hospital patients built in 2012. This remodeling of the hospital provides the idea of, well, gives the idea of new space for the community and a new experience with this artistic project developed within the walls of this hospital in the 1930s. Here we can see 429 crystal panels by Mertzit Hayes, American artist, celebrating the effervescent cultural life of this neighborhood in its Afro-American tradition, which happened in the 1930s. This mural was part of the project run by the hospital administration with the first exhibition by an Afro-American, African-American artist. Alston made these walls called Med and Med Medicine, Modern Medicine, they use an animistic view to represent these populations. The Harlem Hospital murals intended to celebrate African-American art and the involvement of its African-American inhabitants in promoting help and uh, carrying out these efforts. This is in Harlem Hospital, and we see the influences and the aspiration of African-American artists who were behind the cultural renovation movements which were which were gathered together under this denomination these artists took part in the stabilization of these works through the artistic project however circumstances regarding these historical circumstances 
Well, it's necessary to assess the federalistic influence as well as the influence of uh, international projects, especially those uh, within the population. These murals are connected not only to the rebirth of Harlem, but also with the discriminating rejection that they faced because of the local population's reaction. This Harlem Renaissance movement started probably at the end of the 19th century, but its climax is after the Great Depression in the 1930s, 40s. So the economic revolution made everything change in this area and cultural life changed a lot in the in Harlem neighborhood. Just as a few years before, the decadent economy harmed the cultural scenario and economic pressure greatly affected the larger, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest African-American population in the US and thus racial discrimination, police violence are conditions that that uh, oh, which, which the inhabitants had to live with in the 1930s. This was reflected throughout the country because of the economic situation generated by the Great Depression, President Roosevelt's policies, and this helped to extend cultural and art programs of his government. Um, and exaltation of of natural identity local identity here we see a redefinition of american art and we need to rethink what this project this process means a few scholars have said that this populist perspective redefined social democracy support uh, supporting the most affected communities but these federal policies did not include local administrations as for ex uh, and Washington, the capital was set apart, if you will, from these lo local realities with federal integrating policies. <laughs> the idea of the contingency of the FFE ended up branding the collective unconscious with an idea of renovation. This comes up with a second wave of artists who took the Raylum, Harlem Renaissance in, in order to establish African Americans in the 20th century with regard to the projects sponsored by the Roosevelt Institution sponsorship, Roosevelt government sponsorship, um, highlighting African American art. A study stimulated a second rena re renaissance vis a vis this context. As soon as they realized that no initiative of this type could flourish without community and government support. So a communist a union affiliated to the local communist party was suggested which would support artists and would be an essential part of this process and around Harlem Hospital in the 1930s. The administrative autonomy of the hospitals in New York adhered to local policies which maintains racial segregation, despite the abolition of slavery, which denied African-American workers uh, occupying leadership positions. After the depression, Alston was, uh, was named project director to stimulate the production of murals in Harlem. And he, he <clears throat> ordered the uh, many projects and here we can see his mural. And it is obvious with regard to the focus of this artist, with regard to this other one of Italian descent. Here we see the, the participation of the African-American population in weaving Harlem's social fabric, if you will. This proposal is connected to a more pluralistic and united society. But the local superintendent projects and of that the person responsible for the city says that the 
hospital is a city institution and must not divert its content in a more biased way. Also, many years before, African Americans were not part of Harlem's social fabric. Um, it was said by another administrator that they would not should not be part. So Alfred Creamy uh, approved this for obvious reasons, and the Harlem Artists Association demanded recognition of these murals, putting media pressure on institutions and President Roosevelt and the state agents, state-run agencies. Social pressure and artists continued with this project and the murals were then shown between 1936 and 1960. The Society of Afro-American Artists, artists and the association with the left generated the uh, seminal volume of Harlem magazine in 1925, where the cultural abundance of this African-American community was recognized. The communities did not see themselves as proletarian painters, but their art was la laden with um, messages, reports on slavery and the treatment for black people. These the formal recognition of these moral murals admitted the view of the mural culture view and who took part of redefining this community. And on the other hand, convictions, the convictions, <clears throat> we can see here a two dimensional issue regarding a uh, slavery past, the past of slavery, and where the role of this community is re recognized within the nation and full citizenship. On the first floor, we see the panels where they are located. We have a map here of the, of the patient wards with the location of the murals on the front walls on the first floor corridor. We see the eight panels that uh, comprise this work by Virtus Hayes, who narrates a history or a story I should say, of a population that leaves an African reality into a futuristic utopia. Within these realities, we see scenes of celebration of music and work as issues that emanated from the African-American heritage, the exaltation of the agricultural realm, if you will, in the South. Painting, religious practices, sculpture, and other activities. On the right, we see these utopian structures in this utopian future, which show a future, something that can exist and something which can be created based on the integration of sciences and arts in this communal coexistence. We see imaginary idyllic scenes showing properties in African American spaces and the equivalent homologues in a post-slavery era where work was also one of the segments which allowed um, black populations to ascend socially, seeking to recover the past. The artists were, take, were led to represent African art and were finally admitted into the, <clears throat> Africa, uh, the local art galleries due to their aesthetic value. This is an ex exhibition of African exposures in 1927 in Harlem. And Charles Olson could study these pieces, recognize their formal organizations and uh, produce these works. These murals in Harlem Hospital that you see before you established a dialogue between the technological advances of his time and the advance, uh, an African advance. Magic in Medicine on the left shows three scenes where traditional medicine of the past is practiced. In the center of the image, a group of people dance around a fan sculpture. On the bottom, we see, at the bottom, we see a sick person being uh, served by two witch doctors. And here we see 
the teachings being shared with his apprentices by the doctor, an empirical model. Then modern medicine on the right shows the Western medical practices. We see two doctors, one white, one African-American, indicating <clears throat> or giving tips and explaining to their students. Professionalization of medicine is based on technological advances as a model of progress. We see in the center a microscope, which in the image on the left was represented by the fun sculpture. We have a microscope image, in other words, medicine, contemporary medicine. A bust of Hippocrates at the top there, in parallel to the African sculpture in the picture on the left, the painting on the left. We also see how African, the African sculpture gives place to modern technology. So we have connection here between an idealistic past with this new technological uh, realm in the interracial environment of Harlem Hospital. So we magic superstition on one side and modern technology dominated by science and logic on the other side, the right in this case. Here we see medicine represented as a community tradition with religious aspects and empirical transmission of knowledge. Modern medicine, on the other hand, shows uh, its contribution to the American medicine society. These two murals are fed by so many, um, are contributed to so much, and we see the unite the um, union here of a revolution for the two in environments. Cultural, cultural manifestations. So the in the American critical avant-garde realm. We see here with the mural movement, we see this helped to create association and we can see the influence it had on African-American artists and this social focus through the works. Charles Alston acknowledged in later interviews the influence of the Mexican school of painting and the influence on American artists in the 1930s. And Diogo Rivera in 1932 was commissioned to part contribute to the mural during the time he was working on this mural, which as we already know, was built, was destroyed months later after this festival. This mural is a subject about which I had the opportunity to talk and see that on being commissioned in 1936, Alston decided that the means, to, the media to communicate his proposal was through mural culture, which considers the site architecture here, if you will. We see a few <coughs> crystal pavilions and, and to conclude my presentation, I'd like to show you different images by Diogo Ribera. This uh, they refer mainly to public education and also details on Charles details of Charles Alston works in order to acknowledge these associations between magic, mystery, art, magic, mystery, medicine, and technology, and how these elements could bring harmonization to society. To conclude, the policies try to relieve the bad feeling economically after the depression, but after the fragmented postures of the US government, these postures limited the reach of the policies. And there were still some racist policies and federal distances, which talked about the role of the African-American community. Here in the community work, we can see what was done here. And here we ask what can we reflect on about a past that we are imagining? And also the African-American community participation in this na national um, rebuilding. They can be called on 
but the objectives and the goals the goals are of course we uh, are very uh, are very hope inspiring marcus i'm sorry you've uh, you've gone over your time yeah i told you about the time sorry about that Thank you, Marco, for your great presentation on the wall paintings that show the history of colonialism as well. Let's move on to Mariana Vieira de Brito from Brazil. She's going to talk about, graf about graffitis, a spot or insurgent manifestation in the landscape. Good morning. My paper will be based on two articles. One was result of my PhD thesis called Consecrated Landscape in Insurgent Visibility. And then I'll be also talking about another article that I've been developing that hasn't been published which is searching new senses for the small, the little Africa landscape, urban urban landscape as post-colonial practice. So the name of my talk is graffitis, a, a, a wound or a certain manifestation in the landscape. So the first part, I'll be trying to analyze a, a scale up look on the Olinda landscape, on the large landscape and the, the small landscape, and then as an element of questioning the, of the authorized speech of the heritage and then the Council of Preservation of the Historic Site of Olinda. My PhD thesis try to and understand the conflicts in management in the management of the Olinda historic site and and then the graffiti was pretty strong in this scenario you could analyze the Olinda historic site that was created in the 1960s and after 2015 I create I analyzed those minutes and I saw that there was a lot of demand but they weren't accepted. They weren't accepted harmonically, generated conflicts and litigation on the representation of the preservation council. Uh, uh, council. So just to bring Olinda to the map, it is in the northeast region near uh, the capital of Pernambuco, which is Recife, and we have to consider this historical site and think how those conflicts will appear on the landscape. We have two scales to analyze. The first one is the pan. At a first glance, you, you're unable to observe the conflicts, the appearance of a supposed harmony in the historic side. And when you get close to it, when you go to the small scale, to the small geographic scale, and then you got texture and colors. It shows us other narratives on this historic site that were not part, that couldn't be observed on a pan scale. And my paper tried tried to understand this relationship between pan scale and the ground line. I call it small. This is this is small scale. I call it ground line. And then three concepts will help me think these conflicts, scales in Olinda, the 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 discourse authorized by the by the um, by the heritage created by Smith in 2006. It's going to to say that there is a construction, a, a theological construction of assets as an innate value. This would be hereditary and it will also try and ensure national identity, especially in terms of materiality. Another concept I'm trying to, that, that I bring in this article, is dead, dead and living memory. 
It was developed by Maria Gravari Barbas and Ruby Chambre in 2004. And it's going to say that a dead memory is this vestige of the past of the dominant groups that could, that could materialize their existence and their pos social position in the most prestigious areas. And they would change landscape according to their interests. This has to do with the political landscape, the landscape that is produced by the state. They produced forums, gardens, squares, monuments that will have it. They will end up dominating this, this heritage and the historic site in Olinda and in other cities as well. So here we have some concepts for the Olinda historic site and the graffitis and the litigations that happen in the Olinda historic site. So graffitis are in several cities of the world, in different colors, shapes, designs, drawings. A city that is becoming a place that has plenty of graffiti. And then I think, what kind of graffiti is that? I had, well, I searched and tried to understand the importance of graffiti in the, on the landscape, the movements that are connected to that. So we have some examples of movements connected to feminist movements in the Middle East. Important artists that would defend graf graffiti as Bensky in England, Basquiat, the Berlin Wall. So how this graffiti is more and more present in our society and even in historic sites. But graffiti can be split, we can split graffiti into two types of graffiti. The ones that gain more visibility, the ones that are absorbed in, by big revitalization projects in the city. Usually they are uh, panoramic graffiti you can see from far away and they are sponsored Many authors will say that these graf this graffiti can lose their their questioning function. They can lose their transgression, which is a, a critical characteristic of the graffiti. But I am defending that graffiti is very fluid. The messages in the graffiti are pretty fluid. And they were very uh, controversial and generated even uh, a lawsuit. They are valued by the, pri by the private and public initiatives. They generated litigations and lawsuit. They generated some controversy because the first one, I think it's called Mãe Terra. And the drawing, according to the author, the, to the painter, that is a... a an African goddess, and it was painted. And initially, it had the authorization of the building and the locals, but they didn't know the content. They weren't aware of the content. When this appeared, the landscape generated a number of disputes and a lawsuit. One of the one of the inhabitants didn't consider the content. They with the content of the graffiti and they went to court what the graffiti was valued by the private initiative and by the state it ended up becoming an agent of litigation on the landscape another there was another case of the of this a woman with two kids because of the writing around the graffiti is that would be that would be ugly, and this also generated a lawsuit. So, what would be a Batman Isle, which is also considered 
an area of of graffiti that is instituted and when one of the graffiti uh, makers is murdered by the by the Sao Paulo police, they then the graffiti makers get together and they paint all of the aisle in in, in all of the alley in black. So there's a whole reinterpretation. The message that was present in that landscape is uh, it completely changes. There's an insurgent that didn't used to exist. Even though it's graffiti, it didn't used to exist. It exists after a moment that you can completely change the signs and meanings that are present in this landscape. Well, so just to be quick, let's talk about Olinda. So we have some examples of the graffitis that you can see in the, in the Olinda historic site. This is a map of the graffitis between, between 2014 to 2016. And you can understand the location, the position of the graffiti, the size. You can analyze the graffiti, the kind of content of the graffiti. And then I could also analyze the uh, the Olinda Preservation Council, their minutes. I understand the concept of preservation as a political space, as a space of mobilization, of confrontation, and of power dispute. And then I quickly talk about the Olinda, Olinda Water Box, which is a modernist water box. It was produced in 1934 by Luis Nunes, if I'm not mistaken. Nunes Luis, actually. And it brought litigation. You can see it is pretty viewable in the landscape. That's the building that you, was, you know, see highlighted on the screen. And in 2014, a group of graffiteers called Acid requested they wanted to make a graffiti um, as a tribute to the, to Bajar. This has generated a number of conflicts in the Olinda Historical Site Preservation Council. Um, the uh, locals council was against and they created a dossier to request that they would request a dossier to list this what about in trying to avoid the production of graffiti in that water box. According to him, it would have an, a, an architecture value that is pretty big and it couldn't be there would be a change of, 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 of interpretation on the landscape if there were if there were graffiti on that landscape. This but it would be for publicity. The, but there's a number of, of um, there's a number of ads on that water tank. So it was used as an element for, for ads, but it couldn't be used for graffiti. You have two more minutes. This is going to show the fight between what we call dead and living memory. I believe that the local council of, of, of inhabitants defends this instituted heritage, but then the, the graffiteers are trying to change. They're trying to renew. They're trying to put themselves, include themselves in the landscape, renewing according to the elements, the landscape of the Olinda historic site. Here we have some examples of graffitis that you can see in Olinda, some sentences. But to conclude, my paper tried to understand that graffiti in the historic site, graffiti is an alternative narrative to the 
authorized speech by the heritage from the university professors of those that hold knowledge. They think they hold knowledge anyway. And they also, they also said that the graffiti update narratives on the landscape, but they are not present on that landscape before. I also conclude I also conclude that they bring a living memory to the historic sites. They update, they renew a memory of the historic site. For me, graffiti material lies in the landscape. The, the social conflict is pretty clear. The conflict between living and, and that memory, the social groups that live in that city, and that desire that city. In spite of the whole heritage policy advancement, it is also, it's still seen as vandalism, and the landscape is a fight between living and that memory. Just to talk about the second article, I'm not going to go into, into the nitty gritty, but the second article, of, I think, Graffiti of Little Africa, my opinion, that is going to update the narratives on the on the heritage. They try to come out of the her of the narrative about slavery, and they bring new social actors, urban social actors, young ones for uh, Little Africa. So there's a dispute of new meanings about the the the, the, the landscape of the of Little Africa. And in this sense, I try to analyze the black writings. What do I mean by that? Graffitis that have ethnic and racial content in the historic side of Little Africa. So that is something I'm still developing. It is ongoing, but I'd like to bring that up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Incredible presentation there. Very important on the issue of the living memory and about graffiti uh, when it comes to heritage and landscape. And now for the last presentation, we're going to have Rui Leon with a presentation on decolonizing knowledge. And then after that, we're going to open for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to talk about what is known as knowledge. I hope you can see my screen. I'd like to make a quick introduction. But just because of framing, of course, it's, it seems important and try to collect some actions. Within our topic, So we have codes in every single human area. Colonial institutions, through their nature, they would choose the conditions of the uh, autochthony, um, autochthonous peoples as, um, as under people. But it is, it is fundamental in, in, in codes in many years because they privilege others and choose some architecture, landscape, and plastic arts. Every single speech has a principle of using an idea that privileges these, the standpoint. And within this frame, that is an apparent universalism. It has to do with Spivak the other people, the other person can talk in the discussion of identity today it has to do with the, an area of dismantling the colonial speech. But in order to rebuild that, we 
the colonial speech is in the root of the theory of the of the post-colonial theory. We imagine the soul of this relationship, and you can get to the conclusion that after 500 years or even more, there's always a an ambivalence. Um, And many, many others, they are born on, on, the, on the context of a world, uh, of a peripheric world or, or place, and even the global south, and on a daily construction of subjectivity when it re arises from a fight that arises from uh, more, arise for more than 100 years. And it will design within this ambivalence policy. And the very the very construction of the Brazilian soul. There are many projects, many transnational projects integrated to the marginalized populations from the uh, from the periphery, and artists will bring their narratives. And also, in a critical way, this care and this selection and, and this and, and selecting the work of artists, and also when it comes to gender, it reflects the experience of the white man that dominates every single scenario. There's a group of artists here. that seem to be important to reference. Sorry, Rui, your slides are not coming through. I, we, we can still see the first slide, if you could. Oh, there, there you go. Sorry to interrupt you, but I had to do that. Now you can see my slides, yes. I apologize for that. So I was talking about this slide. These artists from Angola, Kiluanji Kiahenda, and his work would question would word question criticism and he censors the ships with African migrants that cross the Mediterranean and there's a rhetoric that is pretty there's largely used with this contro this controversy this phenomenon and he would try to get rid of this meaning And since we have more Portuguese speaking countries here, I'd like to mention some African artists because through their work, they help us understand the past involved in our history. And this has to be understood so we can, uh, come, we can come to terms with our identities. Iluanji, Garda, Monica, Marlene, and Cesar. These are the names I'd like to mention. This is just a small sample, uh, uh, including many, many people. Well, I didn't mention any Brazilian artist, but actually, it is a great pleasure, and I'd like, I'd like. You could realize there's a collective of practices. That is in this, it is in this first generation. It is rebuilding. 
since its root, a voice, it is building a voice that should bring this history and family and this genealogical tree. And that it could exist to a certain extent. It could excavate many, many, many uh, centuries of, of this absence of voice. And regarding this aspect, when we elect, when we, we have a, a selection of works, or a voice in some sort of expression because we're not we will not be able to grow and the world will, won't be able to evolve if we don't have this social and cultural archipelago that constitutes our cities and communities the voices that we lack so much next up i'd like to focus on some contributions uh, that I was uh, allowed to uh, so that we can advance historically. This, these functions bring something that is in this niche of future identities. I have a very que foi uma reflexão que eu comecei a fazer exatamente para este para esta mesa uh, e uh, I would like to bring this to the table and this is just uh, an idea here first is the idea of dismantling this statue by governor Ferreira do Amaral that was the governor in Macau and was a very important person in the history of Macau I grew in Macau, and part of my childhood was also spent here, and I was part of the Portuguese community. And Fernando do Amaral has always been presented as a hero of the nation, but he had a very important role in the humanization expansion of Macau as a territory, as a colony, and in 19... 90, within a negotiation, uh, I mean, there was a negotiation with China in 1990, but so there were 90 years, nine years there. One of the Chinese leaders suggested the Portuguese colonial government, the statute had to be dismantled and had to disappear from the urban space. It was pretty traumatic for the Portuguese community. But when you look back, when in hindsight, I think this act of wanting to admit this symbol, I mean, making it disappear from the public space, that was extremely important for the Chinese community in Macau because it allowed them to question the figure of Hero do Amaral because it was a taboo. He was a hero of the city. But that actually, beyond the positive things he did in the city, there, was, there were deaths and He largely influenced other communities conquered in the, ter in the Portuguese territory. So this questioning is something that allowed for a number of people as, like me to question history the way it was presented to us, the way it was taught to us. And in Macau's case, there are two stories in the city. One is a story that was told uh, orally and, and in writing just recently, and the, the history that 
we got to know as Portuguese, it was just very, it was just pretty different. None of them is necessarily false, but there is a duality here. It's very interesting to see that this ambivalence remains within the space and the debate regarding the city's history. This second function regarding silencing is something that I also see as very important within contemporary perspectives. Notice that uh, it's it's a uh, it's an o, a, a citizen of Oman, Saint Tome, and Portugal, and she talks about history as an artistic and therapeutic um, view. This is about the enslaved Africans and the colonial project. Repeating and telling these stories is essential in order to number the practices of the past. Anastasia's mask, which is part of the Desire Project, which is a multimedia project based on this story, which is included in this book, right? The Memories of Protection, Memories of the Plantation, excuse me. It's a, uh, a, her grandmother told her the story of Anastasia the slave, an African woman taken to Brazil and enslaved and uh, forced to use a mask, which was uh, instituted on slaves so they could not speak words of freedom. This became a part of the colonial project of Europe for over 300 years. It, a black person had this mask with something in the mouth between the tongue and the jaw and tied behind the head by two ropes. The white slave owners used this to avoid that the uh, slaves ate sugarcane while they worked in the plantations initially, but the idea was to implement fear and muteness, the fear to speak. Then Garda says that a in addition to that, this mask had another function, which was that of avoiding that the enslaved Africans tried to commit suicide, which they did frequently uh, by eating, consuming earth, eating earth. So this mask made it impossible for suicidal wishes to be performed, if you will. It's another way of exercising the power of not allowing the subjects to exercise even this power. Sorry, we've already gone over 15 minutes. This brings up a lot of issues about who can speak and who can't, what we can talk about, what happens when we speak, those who have a voice, what voice do we hear? why black people's mouths must be silenced and shut. And I think that in, uh, to wrap up, to conclude, I'd just like to say that uh, this exercise of, of using narratives and applying it to the space of the exhibition through the body, and ex and and the body and multimedia this makes this this the reconstruction of this past the imagination or imaginarium of this past brings up the, the impossibility of the situation and brings it to the public space to the public arena thank you very much thank you very much hui leon your very important contribution, presentation. Now, we have not yet had any questions on in our chat space. 
I don't know if there are any, but in any case, I'd like to thank all the presenters for their excellent presentations. Monica Lacarrière, Rafael Igombo, Marco Polo Cruz, Mariana Brito, and Rui Leon. And I now give the floor, since we do not have any questions on the chat, I give the floor back to Monica, Monica Schley, to conduct the wrap-up, a meeting wrap-up. First of all, I'd like to thank our guests very, very much, our speakers who approached many issues which complemented each other. I thought the, they, the presentations complemented each other. They dealt with issues that are essential for us to think about regarding the many challenges we have in terms of decoloniality. As we had already said before, decoloniality means many things. It means bringing along the voices that were silenced also to have an open mind to listen to other people in order to build something together, a new viewpoint on heritage. I think this is essential, and I'd like to draw your attention. Actually, Rubens is putting this in the chat space. The files of a publication that we made about this seminar, and above all, it includes the discussions at this roundtable with a summary of the presentations. And I would also like to give the floor to Shahid, who will um, bring the event to a conclusion. I'd like to thank very much the, all, the event organizers and those who made this meeting possible. And I'd like to say almost also that this meeting of ours, the first one, is resuming the work being done, work that has been taking place since 2020. And after the Globana on new cultural approaches, 20, uh, June 2021, where collectively conveyed and agreed some um, points were made. First one, the strengthening of uh, alliance network, a partnership network amongst Southern Hemisphere country, peripheral countries, exactly to reach uh, regarding the reach of cultural heritage. Thank you all very much. And I give the floor now to Shahid. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Monica, uh, this was a, a wonderful and, and stimulating uh, global now. Um, and, and, and I think many of the issues uh, are very pertinent. They uh, stretch across the globe. Uh, there are some things that uh, I would like uh, to pursue in, in the future much more. So for example, the, the influence of um, uh, uh, the of, of Brazilian colonialism architecture in, in Africa as it came across from those slaves that came back to Africa, for example. But uh, there are this great variety that we've heard of today, uh, murals, uh, the, the inside of uh, the uh, museums in Mombasa, uh, the whole question around uh, the influence of, of, of Mexican mural art in, in, in New York, uh, the, the ability or inability, as was mentioned through this very useful uh, concept of uh, a dead and living uh, heritage. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's, some, uh, it's an idea that's really worth pursuing. And it's very much tied to this question around uh, what is official heritage and what is not. Uh, and how do these two uh, either meet at some point, uh, are able to negotiate, or will, will one replace the other? So my, my general question would be, um, how do we uh, 
make this great variety of uh, decolonial moves or postures that we currently see happening, um, how do we begin to think about them in ways that uh, can connect in much more practical ways? Will there be, for example, exchanges of, of exhibits? Uh, will there be uh, ways in which museums can, can uh, co-create around uh, these uh, very powerful ideas that we heard today? Um, and I think that we need to begin to use what has been created through uh, this series since 2020, uh, Our World Heritage, new ways in which this kind of cooperation around uh, what we mean by decoloniality and how we can begin to pursue this in, in much more fruitful ways um, uh, in, 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 in public sites rather than just only uh, uh, on, uh, in, in, in these kinds of webinars. I, I would really uh, uh, hope that we can begin uh, also to think around uh, those kinds of issues. Uh, so I leave that uh, as, as, as a kind of idea, a kind of a question that we might wish to, to, to begin to answer in, in the future. Uh, but I want to thank again uh, all the presenters. Uh, this was uh, um, for me quite an, uh, an exceptional uh, experience. Uh, I'm, I'm really keen uh, to, uh, to, to begin to explore uh, the connections between uh, the different kinds of colonialisms that we've had, uh, those kinds of experiences and, and whether we can move to uh, understand this as a more general aspect of, of, of uh, decoloniality in the present. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Muito obrigada, Shahid. É, nós... Thank you very much, Shah, Shahid. We're going to apologize profusely to our guests and speakers. We have already gone well over our time and we have another session to take place this afternoon. So all questions that we are able to gather, we will send you these questions and then we will publish them on our website. I'd like to thanks, thank very much each and every one of you for your excellent presentations and all the issues you brought up here to show us and I'd like to also say that our next meeting will be on the 21st of September. We will deal with the relationships between food, cities and heritage. And I'd like to leave you all my greetings. And once again, I'd like you all to thank you all very much. I give the floor back to Rubens and Michele for a brief farewell or goodbye. Thank you, Monica. Yes, indeed. This was very interesting. This opportunity we had not just to exchange ideas with you, although we're here quiet in our corner, just listening, exercising our listening skills. It was essential to understand the dynamics of each researcher within their cultural structure within in their countries to see how each one of them understands the dimension of this need we have to dive deeper into this debate. Transnational dialogues must continue. It's important that this happen for three more sessions, right, Monica? Three more sessions, two more sessions, two more. One in September, one in October. And we will have the opportunity of diving deeper and creating stronger intellectual, social, intellectual uh, ties. We'd like to invite all those present to this afternoon's session, as a lecture by Professor Pedro Polzad from the University of Lisbon and a group of Mexican researchers, Professor Aska and Professor Catalina will also be here to talk about work they are developing and the book we're going to be launching in September mural and urban art, mural art and urban art. 
we invite you to get to know this production. Thank you all very much. Good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you all very much for your partnership. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Rubens and Michele. And uh, this, this first international EBA Ubi seminar was excellent today. I think it will continue to be excellent. And I think we're going to work on many issues and we will make great advances vis-a-vis -vis those issues. Thank you.